to many Americans, the name of Squanto is inextricably linked with Thanksgiving. It was he, we are told in a sugar-coated version of reality, who saved the pilgrims, bringing them food and teaching them how to plant corn, with the friendship being sealed with a three-day feast that came to be the origins of the Thanksgiving celebration. Today, we are going to learn the brutal truth behind the legend that became Squanto. For more than a hundred years before the arrival of the Mayflower in 1620, the native peoples of what would become New England had been trading with the Europeans. The area was home to more than a dozen tribes, collectively known as the Nini Missinook, or People of the First Light. Relations between the Europeans and the natives were peaceful until the whites began stealing away the Indian captives, who they sold into slavery back in the Old World. The People of the First Light were divided into a number of confederations, which in turn were made up of tribal communities. At the dawn of the 16th century, there were around 100,000 people living in New England, most of them concentrated in shoreline communities. The Patuxet tribe, dwelling in Cape Cod Bay, was a part of the Wampanoag community. Into this tribe, the child who the whites would come to know as Squanto was born in the late 1500s. Squanto was not his real name. When he burst onto the scene and made his presence known to the pilgrims, he called himself Tisquantum, which roughly translates as Wrath of God. It was from this that the name Squanto derived. Squanto grew up in a close-knit community that allowed children far more freedom than any European child at that time would have experienced. He would have spent his youth exploring the countryside, learning how to hunt, and developing his agricultural skills. Wampanoag children lived with their parents until they got married. Like all of the villages along the New England coast, Patuxet was overseen by a sachem, or tribal chief. This person had the power to make laws, enter into treaties with other tribes, and control contact with the Europeans. However, he was subservient to the great sachem, who resided in the Wampanoag village to the southeast. At some point in his youth, Squanto was chosen to become a Pinesi, or helper to the sachem. To prepare for this weighty responsibility, he was required to undergo training to develop physical and mental discipline. This included long periods of fasting and spending an entire winter by himself in the forest with nothing but a knife, hatchet, and bow. Squanto's first direct interaction with the Europeans occurred in the summer of 1614, at which time he would have been in his late teens or early 20s. A ship, smaller than others that had arrived previously, sailed into Cape Cod Bay. A party of Patuxet men, including the sachem and his assistants, paddled out in canoes to meet it, Squanto among them. The captain of the ship was a short, stocky Englishman with a striking red beard. His name was John Smith. The Indians treated Smith and his men cordially, inviting them ashore and providing a tour of their village and surrounding agricultural lands. However, for some reason, the mood changed. A disagreement caused around 40 Patuxet warriors to draw their bows and surround the visitors. We don't know what the spark for this tension was, but it appears that Smith was able to smooth things over, and he and his men left peacefully. Smith then returned to England, where he sought and gained a personal audience with Prince Charles, and was given permission to assign English names to all of the Indian settlements that he had come across. He called Patuxet Plymouth, and the entire area New England. Smith had left a party of men, under his second-in-command, Thomas Hunt, behind. They were told to load their ship with dried fish before returning to the Old World. Hunt, however, of his own initiative, made a return trip to Patuxet. After being received hospitably, he invited a number of natives to come on board and inspect his ship. Squanto was among them. Then, suddenly, as the Indians were gathered on deck, Hunt ordered his men to grab them and throw them into the hold. Squanto and his fellow tribesmen resisted. The sailors opened fire, killing a number of Patuxet warriors. The 19 who survived were put in chains and confined below decks. Squanto was now a prisoner to the Europeans. The kidnappings enraged the Wampanoag Confederacy. From that point on, any European ships entering New England were in grave danger. However, in 1616, a ship entered Cape Cod Bay and introduced a new foe that the native people could not defeat, a disease, most probably viral hepatitis. The epidemic that resulted devastated the Indian communities. 
Between 1616 and 1619, 90% of the New England native population was wiped out. Meanwhile, a group of English separatists, who we know as the Pilgrims, had fled to Holland in order to follow their religious beliefs without persecution. Fearing assimilation into Dutch culture, they requested that King James I granted them a patent, giving them rights to establish a colony in New England. With this in hand, 102 men, women and children set sail on board the Mayflower. They arrived at Cape Cod on November the 11th, 1620. They found a land that was devoid of life. However, signs of death were everywhere. It was apparent that the people who had lived there had all been killed in some terrible event. The pilgrims were ill-equipped for survival. Food soon ran out, and they resorted to digging up buried storage pits left by the now dead villagers. Half of the pilgrims died of starvation and other causes over that first winter in the New World. Squanto's trip across the Atlantic as a prisoner of Thomas Hunt took six weeks. The ship then docked in Malaga on Spain's Mediterranean coast. Hunt was intent on selling his captives as slaves. However, he was quickly shut down by Roman Catholic priests and the Indians were claimed by the Spanish church. The church fathers were intent on making good Christians out of them. Squanto, however, managed to convince his benefactors to allow him to attempt to return back to the old country. He managed to make his way to London, where he was taken under the wing of a shipbuilder by the name of John Slaney. It was Slaney who taught Squanto to speak English and who arranged passage for him to return to North America. Within a year of his release by the Spanish church, Squanto's resourcefulness had got him to a small British fishing camp on the southern edge of Newfoundland. He was back in America, but was still a thousand miles of coastland away from his home. He would immediately set about trying to find passage on a ship that would take him to New England. By selling his value as an interpreter and speaking highly of the bounty to be had in New England, he managed to get himself on board a ship that was bound for Massachusetts. Squanto's ship sailed along the southern coast of Maine to Narragansett Bay in the early autumn of 1619. He was shocked by what he saw. The busy, vibrant communities that he remembered were gone. Not a soul was in sight, and the villages appeared to be abandoned, with the fields being overgrown and the houses in disrepair. Arriving at Cape Cod, Squanto rushed ashore, only to discover that his people, the Patuxet, had been wiped out. He finally came across a handful of survivors. These sent for the Wampanoag Sachem, a man named Massasoit, who came with a party of followers to relate the terrible story of death. Of the thousand people who Massasoit had resided over, less than a hundred remained. After learning that his people were no more, Squanto travelled to southern Maine. He didn't stay there long. Unable to reside among the whites, he journeyed on foot back to Massachusetts. Somewhere along the way, he was captured and taken to Massasoit as a prisoner. Once more, he used his diplomatic skills to his advantage. He told Massasoit of the massive numbers of Europeans who were wanting to come to America and regaled him with stories of the amazing technologies he had seen on his travels through Europe. Squanto tried to convince Massasoit that he should side with the whites and offered himself as the go-between. Meanwhile, news reached the Wampanoag village and that a group of English had landed at Patuxet. After observing their suffering from a distance, Massasoit decided to help them. When the sachem first approached the whites, they were surprised that he spoke a few words of English. He related that he was willing to leave them in peace and give them food if they helped him find his traditional enemy, the Narragansett. Massasoit clearly had his eye on the guns that the Englishmen carried with them. The pilgrims were even more surprised when Massasoit sent Squanto into their midst. Here was an Indian who could speak fluent English. Squanto immediately made himself useful to the pilgrims. He taught them how to fish and how to plant corn and did whatever else he could to gain their favor. Massasoit allowed him to reside among the whites, so a large part of his generosity was motivated by a desire to avoid being returned as a captive among the Wampanoag. After some time, and having made himself an essential member of the pilgrim community, Squanto began to devise a plan to rebuild the Patuxet community. He believed that, with the English behind him, he could become the leader of a new tribe that would be more powerful than that ruled over by Massasoit. He would then become the new sachem. Meanwhile, largely thanks to Squanto, 
The situation for the pilgrims had become far more secure. In October 1621, they held a feast of thanksgiving. It was attended by around 90 Wampanoag warriors, led by Massasoit. Squanto, of course, was also in attendance. The feast lasted for three days. All the while, Squanto continued to scheme against Massasoit. He held clandestine meetings with small groups of Wampanoag, telling them that he could better protect them from the Narragansett with the power of the English behind him than Massasoit could. At the same time, he told the English that Massasoit was going to double-cross them. In the spring of 1622, Squanto unleashed a plan to do away with Massasoit completely. He led a party of pilgrims to Boston Harbor, but had arranged one of his followers to tell the remaining pilgrims that Massasoit was about to attack them. It was his belief that the pilgrims would then lead a preemptive strike against the Wampanoag that would end up in the death of Massasoit. Instead, the pilgrim commander, William Bradford, sent a messenger to the Wampanoag village to see what was going on. It was discovered that the village was quiet and peaceful. Massasoit soon figured out that Squanto was behind the accusation. He demanded that the pilgrims hand Squanto to him so that he could exact revenge. Bradford refused to do so. A furious Massasoit then sent one of his warriors with a knife to tell Bradford to chop off Squanto's head and hands. This Bradford also refused to do. The two sides now prepared for war. It was only the sudden death of Squanto of disease that prevented it. The death of Squanto was described by Bradford, who wrote, In this place, Tisquantum fell sick of Indian fever, bleeding much at the nose, which the Indians take as a symptom of death and within a few days died there, desiring the governor to pray for him, that he might go to the Englishman's God in heaven, and bequeathed sundry of his things to English friends, as remembrances of his love, of whom they had a great loss. Following Squanto's death, there were fifty years of peace between the pilgrims and the Wampanoag under Massasoit. 